a lot of places their solution to a curb ramp, and I guess it is technically legal, yeah, it's just a really narrow, tiny little thing put on the corner that's just about the width of the chair. Well, you know, yeah. think about it. When you shove that out there as opposed to this one, my wife, if she wants to go east-west, half of her is going into the north-south traffic. This one, they just said, hey, why not just make it the whole way around? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Steve Wright, a Miami-based journalist and advocate for disability rights and disability mobility uh, issues. And uh, <laughs> we have a fabulous conversation about how important it is for us to build our, our streets and our public spaces uh, for everyone, for all ages and abilities. And, and we really hone in on how important that really is when we talk about uh, all ages and abilities. So w without further delay, let's just jump right into it with Steve Wright. I hope you enjoy it. Steve Wright, Steve, welcome. Thank you, John. This has been a long time coming. I'm, I'm just really gratified to be part of this. And, yes, uh, yes, it is. So, so Steve, why don't you just uh, uh, share a little bit uh, with the audience, uh, introduce yourself. Sure. I'm a lifelong journalist and disability advocate for a good three decades. Met my wonderful wife at Kent State University in Ohio in the late 80s. And I have worked as a, uh, the chief urban policy advisor for the chair of the Miami City Commission, worked a lot in marketing of architecture, design, mobility, engineering. And I've got my own firm. It's, a, it's called Steve Wright Storyteller. And that's exactly what I do. I use my storytelling prowess to... Uh, to communicate and storytell about building a better inclusive environment. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, you and I got connected uh, through a mutual friend and colleague, uh, Victor Dover. Uh, and Victor and I know each other from uh, the world of CNU, the Congress for the New right, Urbanism. Right. And uh, so you end up doing um, a lot of work locally, is that correct? But then also, uh, is it globally or, or mostly nationally? I, it's Mostly national. Okay. Certainly pre-COVID, I was starting to do some things in Istanbul and, and Egypt and, and Morocco, but uh, it's it's mainly globally. And, and certainly, you know, some of them are hands-on fly there and some are, you know, obviously nowadays we can Google Drive and do input. And, and again, my one of my chief clients is the National Association of Realtors. I do almost all their diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility work. And there's a, a large nonprofit called United Spinal. They work for people with spinal cord injury, although they really advocate for all disabilities. I, my wife has used a power wheelchair for mobility for about 40 of her 57 years, and she has severe rheumatoid arth arthritis. So there's the beautiful one. You've got the ugly one of the pair. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, nah, yeah, she's youthful and bright, and I'm the, the lummox and valet is kind of the way I say it. And then if I impress it, <laughs> if I say anything smart, it's like a bonus. But no, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, again, she's kind of led me through a, a phenomenal life, and, and she He's the ADA coordinator for Miami-Dade County okay. and, and does some consulting. But uh, no, no, just to, to bring it all back home, you know, I, I, some of these interventions you can write about how to get your town right for all people of all abilities and, and some you, you go to. And yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. really proud uh, later this month to be uh, – on the, at speaking in April at the uh, Nationalist uh, American Association, er, can't talk American Planning Association, right. and it's one of their largest conferences on DEI, and I'm certainly doing the, the disability lens for that. And, and uh, very DEI, happy to be what's working that? With, I'm sorry, diversity, equity, inclusion. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. We, since we yeah. do have an international audience and, and exactly. a broad yeah. audience, it's probably good. To, yeah. Uh, I and I do it all the time. I'll, I'll have I'll come I up know. with an acronym, and I, my brain oh, doesn't yeah. even think. Ah, no, and, and it's funny that. because you know I earn my my keep and rent by telling clients to you know don't give six jargon and acronym words in a row. No, you know even your colleague will not know what you're talking about. So yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. We'll keep each other honest, though. No. Well, <laughs> speaking of storytelling and everything, one of the things yeah. that, uh, you know, is so endearing about your story, and, and you've been quite public in sharing it, is has been your journey. Oh, so wow. yeah. your, your journey of, you know, this transformation, this is actually from a Strong Towns uh, article. Correct. And uh it, it was fantastic because there, there's quite a story um, between the, the picture on the, the photograph on the left and the photograph on the right. 
Tell us I a little know. bit about this I journey know. that you've been on. I know. Uh, you know, I... I was that classic, the terrible of, you know, you don't practice what you preach. You know, I'd go all around, whether it was for a, a city highly elected commissioner or just a small blog post of saying, you know, do these things, and you'll be healthy and right. And then I would eat triple cheeseburgers and double pizzas and barely get my butt off the couch, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's almost hard to believe that I spent a good amount of my adult life, probably 100 pounds overweight or more, and you know, ballooned up to 310, 315. And that photo is in Paris in late 2019. So that's not like something from right. 100 years ago. But yeah, uh, yeah. no, I just... When COVID hit, obviously a lot of folks, I guess, baked double banana bread and got beefier and, or others said, hey, I have a little more time. I'm, I'm a little less structured working from home. I can grill some fish or throw in some mango or, you know, grill some tomatoes. And I started doing that. And uh, my wife, like everything in my life, and I'm not saying this because she can hear us. She's in the, off in the other area of the house doing her day job. But, uh, you know, she's the most supportive, fabulous person I, I you know, there's pride in everything, but I don't know whatever. I think I'd be a ditch digger or I don't know whatever, you know, shoveling the dog poo at the park if it wasn't for her. She's she's motivated yeah. me to do everything great. But but yeah. no, just, you know, again, it's kind of what we always preach. You know, if you mix in some transit and, you know, whatever, if you've got four stops to make and you do three of them by transit instead of just getting behind the car, if you shop and eat local and, and if you just walk, it, you know, I, everybody keeps saying like, you know, did you buy some special suit that melted the weight? Did you buy some pills? You know, did you jog in your sleep? Did you run? And I'm like, no, I, I never went more than two miles an hour. If, you know, right. I just, I de-rusted and scraped off the bicycle, but mainly just running along with my wife. And yeah. for so what it's worth, photo, I guess. This photo is, is actually from a trip that you did to, to Manhattan. And yeah. the, the, the title on this is, you know, is, is basically, okay. you know, you at home in an urban walkable places and talk a little bit about that. Cause that's a big part of the connection of, you know, why you're here on the active towns podcast Correct. is this whole concept of how walkable places that, uh, you know, encourage people to easily be able to live a healthier, active lifestyle can help facilitate the transformation that took place. Mm -hmm. You, you are so spot on. That's why we're fast friends. Uh, no, just, and I will even dovetail to, I think, you know, almost anyone that's an urbanist certainly appreciates, you know, road diets, speaking again of our friend Victor Dover and trying to retake some of the urban realm for human beings and pedestrians, not just, you know, I've got a Toyota out parked out front, so it's not like I'm burning the cars, but, you know, let's try to, let's try to extend that for 20 years of use instead of five, right? right and do right, more of yeah. moving the body around. But it, I guess what I was going to say is being a longtime writer about, editor of, poster, uh, writer of op-eds and, and nagging emails to city commissioners for, for disability access, I think what planners are somewhat aware, but a lot of them unfortunately leave out or don't think of, and I think it's an asset, not, not a hurdle, is saying that when you do this, you are liberating, you are connecting people with disabilities. You know, you know there's that yeah. old thing of, you know, the, the, the link in the chain or you're only as, as strong as the weakest link. And, you know, again, not to beat a dead horse, but if my wife, say her wheelchair van is in the shop or she just wants to feel the fresh air before Miami turns into the summer broiler and she wants to go to the bus stop four blocks away, which we chose a very urban area because there is a bus stop four blocks away, you know. If someone parks across the sidewalk because they're cool or they don't want to go in the driveway or they've got a legal union, that blocks her and forces her out in the street and risks her life. Right. If she goes two blocks up and there's a curb ramp and it's designed to where it floods all the time or there's really large open grates for a French drain and her chair uh, her wheel of her wheelchair gets stuck, that is... You know, that is getting maimed or killed. Uh, you know, this is not just a little inconvenience. You know, uh, you and I step over the mud hole or maybe yeah. someone else walks into the yard. She does not have that option. So we're, I'm not not trying to make it doomsday or say, you know, the world's against us. But I think a lot of planners just think, well, you know, I did four intersections of curb ramps. You know, a curb ramp is a curb ramp is a curb ramp. And, you know, I think anyone that's a parent, I am not, but I think if you're a parent, you would not your teacher to say a kid is a kid is a kid, right? right, they, right. You would want, you would want unique if your kid had a learning disability, if, if they spoke better through music, if whatever kind of thing that, you know, yeah. again, it's just, again, it's not just doing, we, we don't like checklist urbanism. Yeah, and and yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the disability oriented just becomes, 
well, you know, there's a bus stop. Well, you know, if, yeah. if it's over a mud hole or if it's blocked by even homeless people, which we appreciate, but you know, that that's a problem for my yeah. spouse. Well, you yeah, mentioned two ahead. things in there. You mentioned block <laughs> blockages yeah. and, you know, when yeah. there's a roadblock and, uh, or more yeah. inc- yeah. In, in, importantly or applicable here, uh, you know, the, the barriers that end up, uh, you know, showing up within that you know, pedestrian and, and mobility realm that we have. So when we look at, when I think of like active mobility, activity assets that we have, I think of, you know, the sidewalks and the mobility lanes, uh, bike lanes, uh, and, and areas where, um, you know, people with physical disabilities, you know, who may, you know, need to be able to get around in a wheelchair, um, there's all these little subtleties that, that have to take place. And so you also had Correct. mentioned the APA earlier. And so this right. is actually a recent article that you had uh, uh, published in, I think, February of this Correct. year and the eight major roadblocks to inclusive streets. We won't have to we won't go through all of these in, in detail, mm-hmm. but it's. It's certainly worth, you know, taking a look at, you know, some of the, the, the very, very simple things, you know, like number yeah. one, that's scrawny yeah. sidewalk uh, that's right. out there. And, you know, uh, again, the, the blockades, the baffling blockades. Yeah. And I wanted to get to this particular photo yeah. because this yeah. is a fun one in the sense that um, – so often we have, and, and and I like this one because it serves two purposes. It, it serves the purpose of, you know, the f- the ridiculous poles that are like yeah, in the way, yeah. as well as the you know the chunked up portion of it. Talk a right. little bit more about you know this type of situation, and and why it keeps happening over and over I and know, over again. I know. I know. And, and again, yeah, bri- this, we really did hit a perfect one. This is walking distance from our house and it's, uh, it's two major, major roads. I know I drew in to show the bad part, but these are major arterials. So this is not in the middle of nowhere where it just you know, impacts one farmer coming out to the end of their lane. This is right. a huge bus route. And this is actually maybe a half dozen blocks from the largest senior citizen complex that, that's publicly operated in all of, of gigantic Dade County. So it's right. a real impact, but just, yeah, you know, again, you know, whatever, I guess the road to hell is paid with good intentions, but th- I think this just shows where, you know, I don't want to be an or stickler in the side, but, you know, how many different agencies, you know, one thing maybe is DOT, maybe one thing's, you know, county, there's different junction boxes, so you just, you know, nowadays, and I think I've said before, maybe to the audience now that I'm not the most tax savvy, but, you know, I've got apps on my phone, I can't design them, right, just like I can't repair my transmission but i benefit one from my jump in the toyota so it's like there's got to be an app somewhere that can do an overlay where you, know, you remember those old you know dial before you dig there's got to be something that says okay you know we're going to put up a speed limit sign you know can we put it at the back of the sidewalk instead of the front or we need a junction box to control the new intersection because it's got timed left turn lanes whatever could we put that where it's not right in the center or you know we have one of those big ugly cement posts to light up things, which obviously light so we don't wreck at night is good. But, you know, can we put it where it's not right where the curb ramp is? I think you yeah. even see uh, with that, by that one curb cut there, you see a little bit of a drain. You know, putting it right at the base of that, it does not make sense. That's inviting it to get stuck in a walker, a wheelchair, caning, blind person's cane could tumble in. And the last one that I'm really a stickler for is that, you know, we all love our technology. You and I wouldn't be conversing this fabulous morning without it. But, you know, I could almost bet my mortal soul that someone came in there and put in fiber optics or some sort of connectivity and they had to break a couple panels of sidewalk. And unfortunately, probably everywhere, but certainly Miami, if you're a contractor and you build an 8% property of your contract, you will push it to 20 by doing a shabby job unless someone scolds you or won't pay you. And you know, clearly they just had leftover asphalt or leftover chunks and they just filled the hole and said well it's kind of back to even with the sidewalk panels well kind of don't work you know i mean you know if you had a 12 year old that was having eye surgery i don't think you want the kind of doctor you want the good doctor that doesn't you know that corrects the problem and doesn't blind them and you know so yeah those those are the kind of problems that just they give me nightmares that that's an impassable intersection for my wife yeah and tens of thousands of senior citizens in miami well, yeah, I mean, you, you just um, you, you, you hit the nail on the head there in the sense that when we talk about creating environments that are appropriate for all ages and abilities, 
That's exactly what we're talking about. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. everyone, <laughs> all Correct. ages and, and abilities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and forgive me for if I'm overly riffing, but yeah. uh, no, you know, a lot of people Google search and they'll say, well, Steve, there's, I don't know, give or take 5 million wheelchair users in the United States. That's, and there's whatever, more than 300 million people. Your wife's an outlier. Couldn't we just build a wheelchair that flies or climbs up steps or narrows to one inch wide or something, which the answer of those, the prototypes of those last about four hours of battery charge and cost like 300,000. So I don't think, you know, <laughs> even an upper middle class family, you can, you know, it'd be like buying a yacht or something. But anyway, you know, back to the main point is, you know, there's that famous uh, Toronto group that's 880 cities and there's right. so many others. And, and that's where I really come in as yes. Perhaps my wife is an extreme example of mobility need and, and her connectivity needs a higher level of quality. But yeah, you know, if you have a 12 year old and that's the first time you want them to bike to the elementary school or bike to the, the summer camp eight blocks away, let's face it, a safe urban environment where cars aren't king, where being on the sidewalk doesn't feel like a, you know, a, a death defying act that serves my wife. If you are building for people to age in place, which, you know, the, the ARP is studied. And what is it? I believe within the next five years, we will have more people over 65 than under 18 for the first time in American history. And that just going to expand and not all of them can move to a three county golf course community in central Florida. A lot of them want to stay where they are. And, and certainly rehabbing their condo unit or apartment or house is part of it, but it's, it's a lot of its exterior. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, like many people, I went through that taking my mom's keys away because she was crashing into too many things and, you know, and she had to move. She could not stay in her house because there was nothing to walk to. So to be yeah. able to get an armload of groceries or just go to the JC Penny and walk around and not go crazy stuck at home, she needed those things. Yeah. So again, this well, is, and you, you've talked about this before. You've talked about this concept of, you know, it's the fad to talk about the 10 minute city and the 15 minute city and, and right. all of these things, but it, it, it doesn't help, you know, serve if your infrastructure out your door looks like that. Correct. Correct. And again, it's just, it's like anything in life. It's so much easier to do it from the start. Right. You know, right. a lot of people say, Oh my God, Steve, you know, we just did an ADA assessment and it's going to cost us $8 million. And I think, well, human beings tend to be worth $8 million out of a half billion dollar city budget. But, you know, even if you don't care about human beings, which why would you be a city manager if you don't care? But you know, it just, you know, if you integrate from that as a start, it might be three to 5% over. You yeah. do it retrofit. I'll give you a quick example. You know, if we built single family houses with no doors, if we just build a shell and then we said, oh, wait a minute we need to have two doors or three doors. And then we, you know, we bulldozed an opening or we dynamited an opening or we just saw it in there. Right. I mean, it would cost a fortune because we might break a load bearing wall or knock over the plumbing or, you know, or just finishing it out to frame the door. Right. It's like all of a sudden each doorway would cost 15 grand. Right. You know, if you frame it out as you're going, it's negligible. It's maybe, you know, 300 ducks for a wooden door. And that's kind of my analogy with the build environment. If you so, get it right the first time, you're, yeah, yeah. you're not going to overspend. So getting it right at the first time, when we look at this this photo, you honed in on yeah. the fact that, yes, there there was some, some work that was probably done and they left it kind of chunked up and, and impassable. Yeah. But I look at this and say, you know, it was bad to begin with. I mean, you've got these poles in the middle of, of what should be, you know, a nice wide uh, sidewalk area and ramp area. Right. Where's the disconnect here? What's what's happening no. here? Is this a planning issue or is this a disconnect between the planning and the building? I think it's all of the above. And very interestingly, there, there's senior housing behind there. That was something I worked on when I worked for my city commissioner, which we you know, we were very proud to get whatever 180 units of affordable, accessible housing. But right. yeah, that was a vacant lot. So you could have set the building. It, it was publicly owned. You know, we weren't suing Walmart to move its entire envelope back three feet. You know, that would be yeah. like a heck of an uphill battle. But yeah, yeah, it's like, why not take another foot of right away or two feet of right away? Uh, you think of, you know, you deduct out all the county buildings, all the schools, firehouses. We could be doing this without some giant taking thing that goes to the Supreme Court. And the other issue is, and I, you know, I have a lot of traffic engineer friends. I have a traffic engineer a client, so I don't want to say that the whole industry's crushed. But again, this this obsession with the car. You know, I don't know all those H two rules, but you know how like you can't. God forbid we'd have a pole right on the edge where if someone was driving like an idiot, they'd smash up the front of their car. So yeah, we 
we pull that pole three feet inward from the travel lane, so that's smack dab in the middle of a sidewalk. Yeah. You know, and pretty soon you have junction box for the stoplight, junction box for the, the uh, light post, for the, and then you have three different yield or lane ending signs, and they're all stuck right in the center. And it just, I, what, what person walks out there and doesn't yeah. think this is where human beings traverse? You know, I mean, if a, if a 12-year-old kid rebounded it and fell out into the car and got hit by a truck mirror and, and was seriously injured for his life, we'd all be saying like, ah. and yet, yeah. you, know, you and I could go to any city anywhere in America and walk for 10 minutes and we'd find all oh. this. I, I can find you know, one in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, I was being charitable. And again, yeah. it's, you know, I started to use the word clutter. And again, I don't want to be fatalistic, but, you know, clutter is like, I don't know, a little, you know, piece of beer can and that's sticking out half an inch into the thing or, you know, thrown down paper towel. You know, these, these are obstructions. Yeah. You know, I, you can't, my wife, you know, could push a little piece of paper out of her road or something or, you know, but the, yeah, these are. Like I said, you know, I don't want to sound fatalistic, but when she gets shoved into the road, she is risking her life just to get to her job. And yeah. if if I may indulge, I, I I I don't feel like the entire world is bigoted, but I do feel like there's a lot of very poor minded approaches towards people with disability. I think a lot of folks see my wife and they think, well, she's in some sheltered workshop or she just volunteers at the library two ways a week. They don't see her as top of her class law school, running a large department, meeting weekly with the progressive mayor of the county, working for hundreds of thousands of constituents. I think we still have this Bronze Age or Stone Age, you know, like if the body doesn't work like an Olympian, you're not worried. And so then I think they think, well, you know, I bet that person just has one of those wheelchair vans. They don't need the sidewalk, or I bet they just work across the street to the library. No, my wife is a very well-paid top person who's had executive jobs in public service all her life. You know, again, if she's late to the meeting, she lets down the constituency. If she doesn't brief the chair of the commission, the bill for affordable, accessible housing may not pass on first reading. You know, again, I don't want to make it sound like she's the president, but, and there are thousands, tens, millions of people like her with disabilities that, you know, they're not just... They're not collecting some government check and weaving baskets. So, you know, they need to be on time. They need to not get their suit soaked by the rain because they had to take a circuitous route. And I think th- th- there's a thing called ableism, and that's sort right. of the parallel of, it's the parallel of racism. Yep. You know, I, we all know if you judge a person by their skin color or culture, that that's terrible. You instantly think they're the, whatever, they're the caddy instead of the golfer, right? And that's, there's a lot of ableism that even at, even at high levels. I mean, I have had planners say historic buildings are historic. There's no way we need to fix them for your wife, to which I say Jim Crow is historic, and we are not repeating that. We are saying that was a dark and horrible, ugly part of American history. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad uh, that you channeled ableism right there because that's exactly yeah. where I wanted to go next. Is Excellent. That, um, you know, the... the the reality is, is that that base level of assumption is, what was it? The, the, the five foot 10, 170 yep. pound male is, is kind of the, the construct of, of how, right. you know, you know, things get designed. And so right. it, it, again, it's, and, and I would even go so far as to, 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 to say that it is five foot 10, you know, 170 pound white male engineer, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, no, again, no, no, you know, channeling in to, some of the, the in, inherent biases that, that are designed correct. there. But you all are not just, you know, pointing this out and, and talking about it and, and et cetera, you're also getting involved. So this, tell us about this particular uh, design course that, that the two of you are going to be uh, working on. Yes, yes. Again, thank you. So this is very few times do, uh, does a common guy first, you know, little hillbilly kid first of his family to go to college, get to live his dream or, or get close to the mountaintop. And, and we had worked and lobbied and refined for a decade. And, and uh, Rudolfi Alcori, the uh, the dean of the University of Miami School of Architecture, green lighted. We are now on, let's see, yesterday we finished week 11 of 15. So we're in the home stretch of a, a universal design course. And it's taught to graduate students and fifth year seniors for the most part. It's a full credit class. It's not some little half credit survey once a month or something. It's just, it's a full out thing. And we've got brilliant students. And they certainly don't uh, do any 3D modeling or catting because the professors are too tech stupid to do that. But uh, no, we 
we address everything from uh, you know you name it. We just you know, school design, airport design, hospitality design, streetscapes. I think the vertical architects kids have probably had their full of planning and urban design because they think of more within the building envelope and client needs more than maybe the entire landscape. But uh, right. it's just been thrilling. We've had. We've had speakers. There's a fellow named Jeff Mansfield in, in uh, Boston who is profoundly deaf and speaks through an interpreter and talks about isolation and separation. We, we've just had we you know we've just had like the, the Mount Rushmore of people come in on Zoom when when they get tired of hearing their old graying professors and the students keep a journal and and right now they're working on a deliverable to basically design an an entire streetscape and again it's more by showing photos it's not you know 3d drawings but just basically explaining you know their journey you know you're at an intersection how do you design for a neurodiverse person how do you think about blindness because most people that are legally blind have some vision so even you know walking into a brightly lit room or confusing color schemes can be an issue so we, right. we're, you know, again, mobility is certainly our, our main insight getting out of bed, but we've tried to bring in every imaginable, you know, low vision, hearing uh, and folks on the spectrum. And, and yeah. hopefully, you know, these folks are really, they're going to go into the world, real world and, and design accessibly. Uh, yeah. um, some of them, yeah, and then some of them are not particularly talking about the class, the, the, the university we teach at because they've transferred or done undergrad other places, but they have said that, a lot of professors, even if a student gets part way and says, well, what about ADA concerns or what about a person wheelchair? And the professors say, oh, just worry about that when you get sued or just worry about that when the client demands it. And that, that amazes me because, again, you can tell I, I love analogies and they would be saying like, you know, we'll only do a roof if, you know, the city inspector tells you to. It's like who right. would build, you know, or just only build out of the floodplain in ground zero Miami where we're drowning, you know, if whatever, if a code inspector catches it, you know, or right. only, you know, only design rain ho range hoods that don't burn down the apartments above when you've got a, you know, a 10,000 square foot high energy restaurant on the ground floor of the mixed use, you know, if, if they catch you, it's like, no, we would, right. I mean, any architect would, would do, those are basics, right. You know, right. you do, you have life safety. You don't say like, well, you know, value engineer the life safety out of it. And yet, when it comes to serving people with disabilities, there's that sort of, well, maybe do it at the 11th hour if you get caught. And that just, that astounds me. I know I am extremely biased because my wife is a person with disability who's a high achiever, but I just, th this can't be onerous. And, and one of the things we try to teach, because I've given you some of the, the bad examples or, or the pushback, is this can be creative. Right. You know, again, you know, if somebody does a really creative way of building above the floodplain without making it look like breakers rocks or something, or if someone... Yeah, whatever. Someone de designs a high-speed elevator or something, and it and it you know you can call it on command easier. Th those are creative things. I, you know, nobody thinks about vertical transportation as the sexiest part of a building, but right. they do it. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and just well, and uh, the reason why I want to linger on this particular image for just a moment more is sure. earlier you had mentioned that you know some people just kind of dismiss the situation that that you and your wife are in and and saying, well, she's an extraordinary situation. The reality is, is that if we're lucky enough to live long enough, we may all have compromises in right. our ability Correct. to get around. And that's one of the Correct. reasons I love this particular image is, yeah. you know, you, yeah, you, yeah, just... you, you have this sort of pictorial uh, demonstration, illustration of all different modes of, of activity and, and the fact that, hey, if this works for everybody you know if this works for the person who is is most challenged or the youngest or the eldest it's going to work for everybody correct and, and, and it, i think that's what it, gets lost in in the reason right. why we end up with you know those areas with the the furniture that's all around oh we'll just go around the pole it's like okay maybe we can but why should we have to right and again to expand you know our course was very very purposefully named universal design right there's a there's the late ron mace from uh, north carolina who who was a wheelchair user with post polio syndrome who's unfortunately been passed away we did not get to meet or collaborate directly but he's the father of that and and I, he was also very personal he didn't want to call it wheelchair design or disability integration design and you know uh, the late michael graves who and unfortunately built some very inaccessible stuff on ocean drive in miami beach and then had a virus that affected his spinal cord and used a power chair for for the last 
several years of his life and he kind of got religion and understood and you know he was doing hospital design with even like tray tables that were even easier to manipulate when you're in the bed well you know you could be there for pulmonary gastric who knows it didn't have to be orthopedic but you know if you can move that tray table without whistling for the nurse or praying that your aunt comes by to help it that's a famous you know right. uh some of those, I remember way back when my wife and I paying a fortune to do an online order even before, like when Amazon was just starting to get these thick-handled knives and forks so she could grip them better because right. she has arthritis and her fingers don't move so hot. Now, you know, you go to these Italian design places and, you know, they're like in cobalt blue and fuchsia and they look they look hip. You right. know, and, now, and I'll give you another really quick example of something that first was sort of a, oh, wow, you know, we need to go to the Ivy League laboratory and do something for these disabled folks and integrate them. Closed captioning was developed for right. hard of hearing and deaf. Yeah, I, I'm not the biggest sports bar guy. You know, you go into a sports bar and there's 18 games playing. You don't want them all screaming. You know, it's whatever, like the main right. game for the home team and then the others are closed captions. Or you go to a fine restaurant and there's a flat screen with like the food channel. And so they're not blaring, you know, the food guy and gal yelling. You see the closed caption. So there's, yeah. there's just, so you're seeing so many of these, again, the, uh, you know, uh, look at the explosion pre and especially with pandemic of the amount of us that are getting the groceries delivered, the hardware delivered, the, not to name a company, but you know, Amazon, all kinds of, you know, you go to an urban scape, right? There's a million people pulling those carts. Yeah. yeah. If you have wider sidewalks and ramps, those folks like it. And yeah. that way, you know, the, the person pulling the hand truck with 180 pounds of boxes, whether it's for a law firm or a home, you know, if those don't go flying off and hit you in the knee, that's, that's a gain. Right. Yeah, I, our house has a fairly pronounced ramp on it. And I always kid that, you know, we've never had a package theft or we've never had something thaw out because the delivery people love us. You know, they leave a note, they hide, they text us, they, you know, cause it's, and when the fridge folks deliver the new fridge, you know, they can go up a ramp instead of carrying it up eight steps because our house is kind of above the floodplain in Miami. And, yeah, you know what it's like. Yeah. They hate you. They don't want to drag away the old one. They bang up the door frame. You know, they're like, hey, I'm in heaven. So right. all these things have zero to do directly with disability, but it's a benefit to us as a whole. So, so getting across yeah. the street. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, here, here, yeah. Here's the challenge that we have here. Now, uh, you, you were nice enough to send me some photos of the, the do's and the don'ts. And this is under the don't uh, uh, category. And this is under uh, the category of the medians. So talk a little bit about um, this and then we'll pop over uh, in, and look at a better example of, of sure. medians. Yeah, just real briefly, this is Ponce de Leon. It's one of the main streets in Coral Gables, Florida, which is a very well-heeled suburb. Of, it's probably the wealthiest conclave of Miami. And they're building a gigantic mixed use. So it's going to go from like two-story, not super urban dense to mega dense right there. And again, you, know, you have a median, so that's a public right of way. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to pay Bill Gates half of his worth to acquire his front lawn to build on, right? It's free land. And you just... Yeah, you know, that one's kind of the bare minimum one, but you know, right. why not widen that? It slows down the car. We everybody that's nervous loves the traffic calming and the it's just you need to create a safe haven. The the thirty second crossing does not work for children, strollers, people with disabilities, maybe supermodels in high heels clicking along, people in wheelchairs. You know, it just I just got back from working in Mexico City, and the, the, the shortest time thing I saw was 60 seconds, and some were 75 and 90. And this wasn't just crossing something was 19 lanes. And you think, like, well, you know, if they can prioritize humans, why can't we? Why can't a human being have a, a minute to cross the street? That's, right. you know, we're not going to, you know, commerce is not going to fall apart. But anyway, this is a more protected meaning because the other one was flat and it almost looked like an afterthought and my wife's you know my wife's a very small person she has the smallest adult wheelchair on the market but, you know her feet were almost whooshing by the cars and that other this is miracle mile so while well, i gave you know whatever a little thorn to coral gables here's my rose to the city we live next to and you know those pylons have lights on it so it's very good for lighting pedestrians in the dark hours that landscaping is just high enough that it feels like a buffer where a car is not going to crash into or a bicycle is not going to crowd my wife but obviously it's not so high that it blocks vision lines right yeah, we yeah. All know I, was, our, I was thinking that too yeah. i mean we do have we a all little know bit our, of the vertical element with the poles correct, but correct. at least the, you know the majority is is above that vegetation level we all know our traffic engineer brethren we have yeah. to fight like you know any anything that looks pretty as an instant view corridor or sight corridor and like 
one person crashed in Detroit in 1959, so we have to redesign the entire landscape based on that. Yeah. Even if that person was driving backwards 80 miles an hour and probably was welcoming a crash, no matter. But again, yeah, and just, you look at it, it's super wide, so cars don't... Cr- Miami drivers are kind of legendary. Almost every year there's some national story where we're in the top five for pedestrian deaths or injuries. We don't really behave when we're behind the wheel. Yeah. So, again, the wider the area, the more striping. You know, let's face it, we're, we're, we're visual animals. We take off on visual cues. So if we yeah. see that, we're not going to crowd. Or even when our storms like all of South Florida, somehow they managed to not stick that there. You notice the junction box and the uh, the garbage pad, the street furniture there are both away from where she enters. You know, uh, picture it. You know, she maybe maybe the battery for hers froze up for just a second, or maybe a car made a right turn and didn't clear the intersection. She's committed. She's rolling. She's got to put on the afterburners and maybe go more like three miles an hour instead of half a mile an hour. You know, when you run into a cage, you could be flipped out of your chair and break your leg or your neck. You know, or if there's a junction box waiting right there and you need to steer around it, that might be just enough hesitation that the impatient traffic surges ahead. I right. know. Unlike a lot of people that have been together for 35 years, I still adore my wife probably more than the day I met her. I don't want to, uh, you know, even if someone said, wow, Steve, you know, you could sue the city and get a $5 million settlement or something when your wife goes to the early grave. I don't want that. And obviously I say that facetiously to, to underscore the, the idiocy of, of build environment where we don't value people. And again, right. you know, yeah. there's t- I, I think I'm a hyper aware person and maybe it's the journalist ob- power of observation. But, you know, I see people, you know, they're the most able by, you know, the woman looks like she could have run in the last Olympiad, but she's got a, an eight year old and a six year old. And, you know, one of the kids starts to dart backwards. Well, right. if you have a wider safe haven, she can corral the kid before the unthinkable happens and the impatient Miami driver KOs them. Yeah. While we're on this image, I'd love to, to, to talk about one aspect of, of how to make um, the pedestrian and bicycling realm, um, you know, a safer realm for all modes, all users. And one of the, the things that, that I'm really trying to encourage cities to, to be thinking about is continuous elevation crossings. Now, usually that's considered on more uh, minor cross streets versus this looks like it's a four lane road uh, with, with two travel lanes in, in each direction. But I still wanna pause on that that concept because it, we'll, we'll take a look at some images in just a moment where we're looking at curb ramps and, and the, the, the do's and don'ts. And then I just think about all the opportunities of what if we had continuous elevation sidewalks and side paths, you know, for, for, you know, the active modes, uh, being able to get across because that really sends a different message to the motor vehicle drivers is that, Oh, I'm, I'm no longer in the go fast realm. I'm transitioning into, uh, a, a pedestrian and, and, and mobility, active mobility mode uh, that's not about motor vehicles, not about cars. Correct, correct. Or it's at least 50-50 or some exactly. way. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not just like, you know, run for your life at your own peril, which obviously we both know. <laughs> right. There are, you know, you can go to some of the greatest, old, you can still go to Boston, New York, Philly, and, and D.C., and they still have some of those that are look a little bit more like run for the hills, and which is kind of ironic because yeah. some of those couriers developed before we even had the, the Toyotas and the Chevys and the Fords on the road. But um, let me, you brought up something that really is on my mind that's kind of a, a cousin to this is there's a fabulous, fabulous person who's a mentor and a friend and collaborator named Charles Brown. And mm-hmm. yep. his Twitter tag is always Arrested Mobility. And, and Charles is African-American and has done a lot of, as he says, inequity for black and brown people. And again, the kind of thing where, you know, a city is 12% black and brown, but 90% of the jaywalking tickets are to people who are of color. And you right. think, wow, this is racist. This is not right. And he wrestles a lot because he has seen me print blog post essays on the whole bicycle thing where I think cities now that we're staying at home and working at the office maybe two days a week or one day a week that's our chance to capture one of those travel lanes for a full bike lane and he kind of got me to come off to be an absolutist of no bikes on the the sidewalk because there are areas where a person does either chooses to or does not have the means to own a car and as cars yeah. get more and more expensive, that's going to be a heck of a lot of us. And as housing gets more expensive, that's going to be a heck of a lot of us. And just he's saying, you know, if a person 
who's African American of color, what have you, needs to go three blocks to not be killed commuting to a you know a life sustaining, a family sustaining job, should it be a criminal act to be on the sidewalk? And when you look at it through that lens, you say, no, maybe we need to do you know maybe we need to have a popular entertainer doing a how to video or you know, work much more on education rather than draconian tickets or arresting, you know, dragging someone off in handcuffs for just being on a huffy for, for four blocks seems right. not the solution, even though I do not want someone to bump into my wife because if they bump into her, uh, she's had so many uh, hip replacements that she would probably be fused in a seating position. A lot of people think once you're disabled, you're disabled, but she could have a horrific rest of her life and sleep curled up like a ball so yeah. again i to me the main answer did not be windy but you know, again i can't look at four different directions of my neighbor without someone who's almost completely telecommuting they go in for conferences maybe it's that tuesday thursday one week monday wednesday friday the next let's face it we're not commuting like we were and then we're using ride share and we're using trans so i think almost anywhere those three lanes can become two and we could correct you know we could put in those bike lanes yeah. And those bike lanes could also be for the micro mobility scooters. Yeah. And I pulled so. up uh, uh, Charles' sure. uh, podcast yeah. Uh, yeah. website here. So, again, uh, Arrested Mobility. Charles has been a, a previous guest on this podcast, and he has his own podcast now. So, I do highly recommend everybody check that out. And this is uh, arrestedmobility.com. And then you can also just you, know, you can sign up for and subscribe to his podcast, um, you know, wherever wonderful podcasts are found no, and he's just, <laughs> I, I just and to me he's you know as, as i'm a beginning professor to me as he's just that perfect thing where he does the research he has yeah. that pa which you know you're looking at a guy with a bachelor's degree and a b average but you know yeah he has that phd but he can talk you know like your favorite neighbor over the backyard fence which is again something we need as, as urban activists to you know break it down to the mom and pop level not talking in the ivory tower yeah. lingo so yeah. getting back to some of our wonderful uh, uh, photography here of what not to do. <laughs> Take it away, Steve. You just, I know, I'm going <laughs> to smack my forehead till it's bruised here. But, and this, this is where my wife's first workplace when we relocated from Ohio to South Florida. This is Miami Beach, Collins Avenue. You can't get much more density and urban in South Florida than here. You know, a lot of South Florida is car expanded and, and single family houses, but this is... You know, this is where the world comes to escape. This is a couple blocks from a convention center where the world comes to convene. You know, I, I think Miami Beach has 12 times the amount of visitors in their city per day than, than residents. So, you know, this is, and again, you know, street furniture, great. I think we've all walked down a sidewalk with a pizza slice box or some garbage and we don't want to litter, but it's like, you know, where are this, where's the, where's the garbage pillow? So good thing, but who specs something that's like the size, you know, you could throw out an entire condos and who... This is, happens to be uh, moored into the ground, so I think sometimes I still think I'm 300 pounds, and I go try to manhandle something and throw it back against the uh, the fence there, and I you know just about break my back and legs. But uh, yeah. you know, it's just like I mean, this thing's just like you know, it's like eight things in one. You know, first yeah. you have the flooding issue. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, that's that's exactly where my mind went when I saw this. Yeah. And I was thinking of, you know, the continuous raised elevation of, you know, sidewalks and, and, and crossings and things of that nature. And here you see that it's 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 not, the elevation isn't even there. Yeah. No. In, in Miami, you know, because we are very water prone, you know, we we crown the street real yeah. high, which just makes an even worse. And by the way, that water in that previous slide. Yeah. That was, we, it had not rained significantly for 75 days. That actually happens to be tidal flooding because of sea level rise. So that's a whole uh, other issue. Thank you for, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. This wasn't like, the, you know, after the biblical rain receded and it was just one little corner. This yeah, is, you yeah. know, so again, we need to start result. And I, I, forgive me for doing another say, you know, let's face it, you know, New York has had Superstorm Sandy and, and, and that thing a couple years ago that flooded apartments in Queens, you know, it's not just a South Florida thing. Louisiana, Louisiana's losing football fields worth of coastline every yeah. month. You know, we're the Midwest is having storm winds, but yeah, when we invest our billions and obviously every city manager and county manager is hoping that it's maybe 80% federal, right? So yeah. when we start doing that, think of the grand opportunity where if you're going to spend a billion on streetscapes or hardening your environment, how there's your money to do all those crosswalks, all those transit connections, all those 
stations on the L or underground in New York that are unreachable by a person wheelchair. There's your time to do two birds with one, yeah. you know, just like yeah. whatever, you know, if you have a fire at your home, God forbid, you know, you, if you redo the kitchen, at least you come by with a completely modern, better wired kitchen. So there's some plus yeah, this yeah. sustainability can, and, and resiliency could be a huge boon for inclusion. Yeah. This is my favorite kind of, oh, sorry. I was going to say, the, these, this series of images is, is meant to be a, an example of a better way to approach these layouts. Correct, ramps. correct, so, yeah. And they, yeah. I, I believe between design and, and implementation, this was an $8 million, five block complete streets. Mm -hmm. They didn't call it complete streets, but it was. But anyway, um, I forget if we have one of the bad images, but a lot of places, their solution to a curb ramp, and I guess it is technically legal yeah you know, it's just a really narrow tiny little thing put on the corner that's just about the width of the chair well you know yeah. think about it when you shove that out there as opposed to this one my wife if she wants to go east west half of her is going into the north south traffic you know right. when you push you all the way to the edge pinch point so again she's risk even if you put up a no turn on red you know that's kind of like you know, murder's been outlawed for all of America, but we still have cops to chase down the murderers, right? The sign doesn't, you know, the law doesn't mean instant goes away. So, yeah. yeah. When you pinch her into a pinch point, you're forcing her out into someone making a right, and, you know, they'll probably just give that person a ticket. I may be burying my wife when she has, whatever, decades all left on her life to educate and make the world a better place. This one, they just said, hey, why not just make it the whole way around? You know, yeah. that way if, uh, you know, Whatever, you know, say there's a tour group and they're all kind of just gawking around and don't notice and they block one part of it. We've still got room. Look how yeah. wide that. Well, yeah, that I mean, so, so let's is. talk about uh, let's talk about this. This is a great image because we have two people standing, you know, together uh, across the way. And you had mentioned it earlier is that, you know, oftentimes the the ramps are, you know, so narrow that, you know, your right. wife is barely able to make it through. Not to mention the fact that. What if you're with her? What if you're Correct. walking side by side and, and we're having a right. conversation? What about the dignity of, hey, yeah, let's let's make these wide enough so that, you know, two people can be carrying on a conversation. Oh, yeah. It's one of the, the arguments that we right. have for for making wider bicycle uh, routes is so that, you know, a, a parent and a child can be riding side by side. And and, you know, and that's a good thing. It shouldn't be single file. We should be creating more generous space so that you can, you know, I would even so go so far as to say that you could have two people, you know, walking side by side and being being able to pass each other going the opposite direction on the sidewalk uh, with Correct. somebody. And, and again, you know, I, 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 like I said, I'm certainly perhaps have a bit of a chip on my shoulder. It probably shows. I try to always, you know, I present solutions because you can't just tilt windmills. And, but yeah. You know, sometimes people are like, well, you know, if I do it ADA, it's going to look special or it's going to look deviant from the norm or it's going to look too institutional. It's like, again, you know, you're an urbanist. I don't want you to say what you think I want to say, but want to hear. But to me, this looks beautiful. It looks comfortable. It looks roomy. It looks like something that may calm traffic a little bit with the visuals. I don't feel yeah. like that looks like, you know, I think a lot of people, the minute they hear ADA, they think it's a, I don't know, some house of bedlam World War II, worst VA hospital that's gray and narrow aisles and stinks of whatever death and decay. And then, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that's the reason, one reason why, you know, that, you know, that universal design is so important because it, it, it does reemphasize the fact that we're, we're not talking about designing two disabilities. We're talking about universal design. This is for all ages and Correct. all abilities. Correct. And it should be beautiful because if it right. is a truly safe and inviting environment, Correct. we can help and encourage more, a culture of right. activity and more active mobility. Correct. And I'll give you another quick example that I just, again, being a reporter, I guess I always observe and, uh, the, uh, High top tables. Mm -hmm. Not. I'm not saying to completely outlaw them, but you know, during COVID, almost anywhere in Miami, in 20 different jurisdictions, you know, we all love our sidewalk cafes in the winter, especially in Miami when it's like June for everyone else. Yeah, instantly they just got high top tables. I don't know if they thought they looked cool, if they thought they were a little more narrow. Well, you know, that's that's basically just telling my wife, do not enter, forget about it, don't have a drink, don't have a peanut, go home. And I started looking the high top tables anywhere where it's 50 50. Yeah. 
99% of the low tops are taken first, you know. Yeah. Men that are below five six, most women that are below that are that high, anybody with children, you know, they don't want to climb a tower and have their legs dangle. You know, right. I, one of my dearer friends is not a particularly tall guy, and I think he's a little self conscious. He doesn't want to have his legs dangling until they get numb. You know, right. up on the again, it's just I. Uh, there are a lot of uh, bars that are being built now with part of it being lowered to wheelchair height. Yeah, and it has a regular chair that rolls up, so. Yeah, it's not like the bartender goes broke because he doesn't have four wheelchair users, you know, drinking cognac every hour on the hour because you can still poke up a regular seat. Uh, and again, this is that, you know, road to hell through best intentions. This is on the Miracle Mile. They decide, hey, we'll have pets turn activated. I happen to be a person in urban areas. I feel like there should just be regular intervals. You know how some folks call the pet activated the bag button, and it's like, yeah. if we're going to if we're going to equalize for bikes and and walking and children and families and older people aging in place. Why can't you just have a certain interval? You know, is is yeah. is a continuous line of traffic at all hours of the day that crucial? You know, whatever. Even if it's rush hour, I guess the answer is get your rear end out of bed five minutes earlier and don't run over my wife. You know, I don't feel like that's I'm asking you too much wages, but you know, yeah. again, you mount this thing. This is like eyebrow height at me, and I am that proverbial five ten able bodied male. Yeah. And then yeah. you put it on these hurricane strength stanchions, and yeah, look at that post. I mean, and it, she's not faking it there, you know. This is not the OJ like the glove doesn't fit or whatever. This yeah, is, yeah. she just literally, now she does carry a reacher stick, but sometimes it will fall out of her hand. It's just like, again, you know, I don't need Harvard educated, you know, Philadelphia lawyers on every public works crew, but somebody has to go into the field and say, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. Is that 36 inches height, you know, and, and even if there's a range allowed, are we doing it the best one? And then look at the over there, and I think this is because of that giant mix used across the street, but, you know, there's like, I don't know, there's like a dozen utility vaults. It's like, right. and if I'd have had an even tighter camera or better depth, depth of field, half of them are offset. They're one inch tile. They're two inch high. And then you just have that, the asphalt. And this was not like a little one weekend continuous pour concrete, we'll fix it. It's been like that for like 18 months. And yeah. the regional court, you see that little brick fence, the regional courthouse is behind that. So it's a very high traffic area for folks. <laughs> not, not all of them park there for a traffic ticket. This happens to be right at the bus stop because Ponce goes all the way to our airport and back. So right. again, yeah. just, you know, I, I want better. And again, I don't think I'm asking you to put, you know, I'm not asking for a ruby encrusted pet activated light or, you know, fine golden tungsten used around those vaults. It's just... Lay them in an even thing. Put down concrete. If you know you're going to break them three months from now, it's worth the effort. So you break what? You break four concrete panels. You know, it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. I'm sorry. Here's one other thing that comes to mind. That yeah. this is one of my nightmare ears where I go to testify as city commissioner or, or Burdock an item. You know, in the morning, every commissioner. They could be the staunchest right wing fiscal conservative. They could be the most progressive in between. You know, what do they say? This is Miami. We have terrible income disparity. We have immigrants. We want job, and I happen to agree with that. I want job. You know, even you know, Mr. Manager. Even if it's a bunch of high school kids pushing sand from one end of the lot to the other, we need jobs, right? Because we need income going into our community. And I'm thinking, I'd like the job to be more productive than that. But yeah, and then you know, in the afternoon, someone comes to say, "Hey, my bus stop is inaccessible. I need some concrete poured," or "Hey, you need to redesign these utility vaults. They're tripping me out of my chair." And I get this, oh, no, we're going to go bankrupt doing disability work. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> Dial back three hours into your transcript and you will hear the let's get manual labor job for, right. you know, people. Because, again, you know, I, I love our immigrant vibe. But you know, a lot of folks come here, they they're have limited English. You know, Haitian Creole is their dominant language or Hispanic. And, you know, again, the you know, you, odds are you can... You, know, you can move concrete or you can drag the water for it without, right? You don't need a Harvard education or you can be learning your second language. And if there's a person with disability that can't do the physical work, they could be the one charting it. You know, again, I'm not saying they have to be a surveyor, but, you know, they could draw, you know, whatever. Maybe you bring in people with the DUIs that are doing the community service with their little orange vest. You know, they could be the person who can't physically move. It could be writing the checklist to see that the person showed up at nine and checked out at one like they have to or that, you know, if the contractor said they were going to use grade A, whatever, PSI 30 concrete and pour it for six blocks, they don't do it four blocks and sneak home and pray that they don't get caught. So it, it it's a perfect circle. 
Yeah. And yeah. yet, you know, when they go for their new lunch, and, and all you know, all knowledge drains out of the rear end, and there's no connectivity with that. And well, here, I'm the one. Uh, well, you know. let's, let's do this, Steve. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to wrap sure. us. I'm going to wrap sure. us up here in just a moment. But I want to, I want to shift gears and 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 sort Please. of channel a little bit of Paris and Miami mm. at the same time. And, and so, you know, Paris, obviously, is, it's big news that they're, they're moving forward to try to decrease the number of motor vehicles coming into the right. city center. Um, Paris is also a, a place that has, uh, you know, big challenges in many of the, the neighborhoods from a, a pedestrian realm. There's a lot of competition for uh, the limited amount of space uh, uh, available in the pedestrian realm. And so uh, Mayor Hildago is, is you know, being quite upfront and saying, you know what, hey, we need to do this. The climate is a big part of the reason why we're doing this, but also the fact that uh, our air pollution is unacceptable here. Miami is unique in the sense that, you know, you're one of the cities that is being hit, hardest hit, you know, due to sea level rise right now. So where I'm going with this is channeling sort of the that that thought process or that uh, that effort of redefining the the road space and creating protected cycleways and and creating more space, and one of the things that we've learned from the example of the Dutch is that those very very uh, attractive, safe and inviting cycle networks are all ages and all abilities and all mobility modes types of approach. And, and where I'm headed with this is that, you know, when you have truly traffic calm streets and a network of protected and separated infrastructure for bikes, people in wheelchairs and mobility devices of all different types are also able to benefit from that. It seems to me that that's a strategy that many cities in North America can start to look at because you just pointed it out there that it's incredibly expensive to um, to redo the actual sidewalks and make them truly wide enough, especially in some of our, our more challenged neighborhoods. But, you know, redefining that street space that we have and almost every photo that we looked at uh, here, you had four lanes of traffic where right. you probably only needed one lane in each direction. I yeah, again, well, yeah, you're talking to the choir there, but correct. Yeah. And, and again, you know, Paris, I think, is such an interesting example because I adore it, but it is a, quite of a challenge for my wife yeah. to get around in. So I'm hoping that eventually, yeah, you know, Paris has very narrow sidewalks. And I don't know me, I'm going to say two out of three intersections have curb ramps, perhaps less than that. Some of them are incredibly steep. So the ramp would have to go, you know, not a city block, but much more more than our normal little one panel thing because Paris is such an expensive place to live. And I'm thinking, if you're going to do that, then, and, and you know, I think with the other things we go to Paris is, you know, it's not filled with, with Walmarts and Targets and JCPenney and Best Buy, right? It's all those individual things. And you're like, wow, there's millionaires here. There's, you know, you could, I'm sure you could get the traffic. And, you know, some of those are way out in the outskirts. But, you know, most of the core air and desmonts are all mom and pops. And we just, we go nuts for that, right? We say, I'm going to get fat on this croissant. But it's it's unique to the, you know, to the 11th or it's unique to the 5th. And, and we enjoy that. Well, you know, if you've done zoning or other things to help keep unique mom and pops, where I'm going with this is you need mom and pop grants because a lot of those, you know, those are 200, 100 year old, you know, houseman buildings, older than houseman buildings. So they're up a couple steps and they're a narrow threshold. And I don't want to kill a fabulous ice cream store and a fabulous couture shop just for the sake of building a brand new target that can afford to blow up the block and make it accessible. So I think cities need to create a mom and pop grant and, grant and say, okay, you know, we know you're making a living, you're not making a fortune, you know, we're going to redo your stoop and we're going to make a ramp into yours. And, you know, maybe you have to match 20% so you have some skin in the game. I don't think that's onerous because, you know, let's face it, any shop, if you know, if it's a designer shop, they've redone their window display. You know, if they don't want to be disgusting, if it's a restaurant, they probably replumbed their toilets from 200 years ago. So they've, they've spent capital money, but why not? You know, if we're going to redo transit if we're going to take bike lanes and spend it in infrastructure why not another eight percent of the overall billions and say we're going to do those mom and pop grants yeah. and you know and again or like that maybe even a mom and grant to turn two tiny little because certainly we've done that paris my wife is ambulatory for very short distance when she's holding my arm you know we've done that turn sideways and suck in the gut even if you're normal body weight to get in that you know the, the paris door you know, the bathroom looks like it's 19 inches wide the little baby doorway right. yeah, yeah you know 
if you demo both of those and made a unisex, which, you know, even that with being friendly, trans-friendly, or, you know, different intersectional things, or, or you know, uh, opposite-sex parent taking their child in to change a diaper, you, all those things are comfort with the family or unisex restroom. So once again, we land on the end point of universal design, where universal it design. makes a more, it's a more friendly restroom for my wife, but it's also a safe haven for all sorts of diversity to feel comfortable. And I did not grow up in a household that was particularly charitable for the people that were different, but I will leave this world as a person who does anything that's more inclusive and is loving to all our people. Because yeah. cities are diversity, and if, if cities are exciting because there are people of all different religions and gender orientations and abilities, right? That's, that's why we make creative things and, and have those chance encounters that make life so dearly worth living. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and, and I'm, I'm inviting you to, to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it, 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 my belief is that, you know, being able to create a, a truly attractive all ages and abilities, you know, network, uh, for, for all modes. And, and it seems like that's a direction that, that North American can go. Am I missing something there other than the obvious fact that we need to slow down the motor vehicles that right, if there's motor right. vehicles adjacent to them? No, it uh, again. I you know don't want to sound negative, but it it it, it boggles my mind that there is so much pushback on that because as right. we said, you know, and I think it adds value. Uh, another analogy, very quickly, you know, I'm sure when Lead was first coming out, and someone wanted to build a giant headquarters for a hedge fund or a mutual fund or an investment, the first you know the the point person for that thing, I said, wait a minute. It's an extra 11% on the top to have e-glass and low-flow toilets and whatever else and, you know, try to source things locally. Are you out of your mind? You know, we're going to spend $120 million to build this Manhattan skyscraper. You realize what another 11%, you know, that's, that's, that's a mansion. And someone convinced, and, you know, there, there may be some gaps in lead, but for the most part now, you know, if, if, if a retirement fund or an institutional investor wants to acquire a 15-year-old building, they want it to be completely lead certified and, and low flow. They don't want to think of, you know, maybe they'd pay 28 million instead of that original 11 to convert it, right? And so, and that ups, that, uh, that initial fractional 8% extra, 11% extra is looking like the greatest investment on earth because those billions, they rise in value and then they're more flexible. So again, you know, if you design something that's more inclusive and comfortable, whether it's the floor plate of an office building or the streetscape to cross Main Street, you've added value. I don't have a Harvard study to show you the exact dollars and fractionals over, you know, returns from Wall Street. But I, as you mentioned, those 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 northern European cities, they add value. One of Paris's biggest problems is that it's so walkable even before being more. You know, it, it's driving people out of the price, right? It's so wonderful to be able to walk around and not just drive to, to strip malls that it's, you know, so I, I think we've shown the intrinsic value, right? right. I mean, there's... There's areas of neighbor, you know, there's areas of New York in my youth that I would have run for my life from, you know, when I was going to show in Lower East Side. Now I couldn't afford to, to rent 200 square feet there. So I think, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, connectivity and urbanism has a huge intrinsic value. So yeah. making things more comfortable and friendly for my wife, I think, is a huge bang for the buck. But it's, it's an untapped one. If you are a planner or a public servant watching this, listening to me, here's your hidden secret. Here's your way of, you know, going to the racetrack and betting on a winner and, and tripling your money. Yeah. But the analogy is so perfect because if yeah. universal design drives design, yeah. then yeah. we've branded a way of being comfortable and not, not having the owner stopping halfway or at the 11th hour. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Steve, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This, this was a thrill. I re you're just spot on, and I love sharing the message with you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode with Steve Wright. I hope you found it interesting and got a lot out of it. I know I sure did. Uh, you know, it's, it's so incredibly important when we think about building our streets uh, for people, for, for all people of all ages and abilities, that we take into consideration, uh, you know, not just the sidewalk, but also, you know, the mobility lanes, the bike lanes, the, the a cycle network for all ages and abilities. Uh, it really is empowering because if we build those facilities so that they are truly welcoming, truly safe and inviting, uh, it becomes an empowerment for, for people uh, who may need to use a mobility device of, of various different types. 
and, uh, and and looking at the details, you know, getting down to understanding the difference between a, a curb ramp that is is truly safe uh, and and welcoming for somebody who has some mobility issues. Um, so, anyways, again, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did get something out of this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help. Uh, leave a comment, share it with a friend, and if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just click on that subscription button down below ring the bell next to it, which is for notifications, gives you the ability to customize what your notifications uh, preferences might be. And uh, gosh, you know, I've, I've got some exciting stuff uh, up, coming up for you as well as another episode on Friday. So <laughs> hold tight on that. Uh, Darcy Kitchen uh, will be the next episode. And uh, of course, we've got uh, the study tour that'll be heading out to Colorado at the end of August and into the first week in September and then also the study tour in the Netherlands at the end of October, heading into the first week of November. So if you are interested in either of those two, be sure to send me an email at john, that's J-O-H-N, at activetowns.org. Uh, don't forget uh, the Active Town store. Uh, pop on over and, and take a look at some of the fun Streets are for People swag that I have out there. And finally, uh, we picked up yet another Patreon supporter. Thank you so much for those of you who have signed up for Patreon at this point. I think we're up to almost 30 people. Uh, it really does help out a great deal. Uh, gives me the ability to keep bringing this content to you. So if you can spare a buck, two bucks, five bucks, whatever it might be, uh, please pop on over to patreon.com slash active towns. And uh, again, anything that you can give is really, really helpful and keeps me going. So there you go. Well, hey, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.